And just to start us off, I want to acknowledge and mention and foreground that we are on the unceded, stolen, illegally occupied lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salish nations, and as well as if there's anyone joining from other places on the nations of those places. Um, I think it's important to keep us all aligned and keeping us working in a good way and speaking in a good way about the work that we do and the importance of the work that we do. So uh, thank you for that. And just to give you an idea for the format of this talk, I'm Natalia Ladinsky, I'm with VMF. I am the director of creative projects and also um, Drew and I have been collaborating on quite a bit of the curated by VMF murals that have been going up. So I might also step in and talk a little bit as a curator as well as, as, well as the moderator. Um, so we're going to start off with all of us talking about our projects. Um, unfortunately, uh, Crystal Perbu was not able to join us today, uh, but you can check out all the incredible programming that she has been putting on. Uh, it's all live on our YouTube. There is um, a talk on Afrofuturism. There is a talk from all of the artists that uh, have been curated as part of the Black Cyclone Resurgence Project um, and a number of the other programs. So please check those out and imagine them in conversation with us. And what we're going to do is go around the room, talk about some of the projects that we've done, and then uh, do a little bit of an experiment. I have heard that this works, so we're going to try it out, which is uh, a round robin of questions. So. Uh, I'll probably start us off, tag someone, they will decide, answer the question, decide on the new question, or maybe augment the first question, bounce it off to the next person, and so on and so forth. And we'll um, do a few rounds of that and then open up the floor to the questions from the audience. And um, as I mentioned before, that can either be through the chat or through the Q&A. Um, so we've allocated two hours to this, but it's we, we might wrap up sooner just so that we can let you all go and have the rest of your lovely night on this Thursday night. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm going to hand this off to Drew Young because he is our lead curator and one of the founders of this organization and the person whose fault it is that we are all doing this in many ways. So Drew, over to you. Hi guys, Drew here. Um, Yep, most of you are probably familiar with my role at the festival. If you're not, I'm lead curator. I've been here uh, since the festival's inception in 2015. And since then, I've yeah, tackled hundreds and hundreds of projects curatorially, production wise, creatively. And I, I work really closely uh, with Natalia and our project managers, uh, Mavreen David and Parm Joe Hall in getting artists aligned with uh, projects in the festival. I also sync up with the production team and we comb through all the artists projects. Uh, we do these one on one meetings where we all sit down, look at designs, look at all the problems associated with walls and challenges. How do we scale up line work and get drawings on the wall? How do we deal with challenging textures? Um, and yeah, I think we've seen just about it all when it comes to styles and aesthetics and challenges, but uh, I'm not gonna be too confident and that's gonna be a, be a constant. So yeah, for this year, um, yeah, I guess maybe like I wanna kind of talk about I get a lot of questions about how artists get picked for this festival. And we have a really, really heavy duty application roster every single year. I think we were looking at about 600 plus applicants for this year, which is on the higher end of things. But of course we're getting emails from all over the world uh, from agents and managers uh, passing off uh, recommendations for the artists that they represent. I also sit on, have sat on many panels before. I've worked on multiple arts festivals, Spanish Valley Music Festival, Skookum Festival, TEDx Vancouver. So I've kind of amassed this like Rolodex of people that I'm, I'm always trying to look out for. And 
what we generally do is with the applicants, we kind of cook them down and we're always looking for everyone's superpower. And, you know, sometimes those superpowers aren't necessarily like equipped for a mural. Sometimes they are, but we're always trying to make sure that we've, we're, we're keeping as many artists on the side of our desk when an, an opportunity particular to them comes up. So, you know, I, I've, there's a couple artists this year who are like, how come we haven't worked together? And it's like, well, the stars haven't totally aligned just yet. Um, you're in our like master document, which is uh, these really beautiful little one pagers that represent artists. And after we have what is called a discovery meeting with a client, property or neighborhood, we go back to this document, we start pulling pages and you know, we, we've got to keep this document fresh and heavy. So the application process is really, really key for us to, to keep growing this document that allows us to have as many fresh faces as possible. And yeah, it's been a, it's been a really incredible journey this year, uh, working with Natalia who is a far more professional curator than I am and far more experienced. And, you know, we've been able to really kind of collaborate and work together and build on this document and, and um, yeah, see things that one another might not see. And so we've kind of like grown into this awesome superpower that I think um, has really been beneficial in allowing so many projects to happen and, and so bloody quickly. Um, so I'm going to talk about three projects today and, uh, whoops, I gotta do screen share. Hold up. Wait, how do I do that? There we go. Oh, okay. Okay. Bear with me. This is the universal condition. No. Yeah, I haven't used but, but whatever we have been told the universal condition is, whether that's like colonization or human suffering, uh, it is now also, can I share screen on Zoom? Um, have you been able to get in, it, in there? Oh, uh, yeah, it's not doing. Wait. Oh, oh. There we go. Bingo. We got this. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So I've been really drawn to Anae's work for a, a couple of years now. This is a really great example of how to get yourself projects. Um, style and colors of sides, recontextualizing your work on these big walls, um, be it they're massive and probably out of our scope generally for the festival. It is a fantastic way to be able to sell your work to clients um, and sell your work to, to our team as well. We will do these sort of mock-ups through, through the um, uh, curatorial process, but if you come out the gate this hot with these beautiful types of mock-ups like you're going to get people's attention and and she certainly got ours this year i think it's her second wall she just completed a wall before working with us uh maybe a month prior but more or less a, a new muralist to the scene Do we still see this it doesn't want me to change pages Three seconds, please. So I think it's also, um, if we want to talk about NA's project a little bit more. Um, I got it and all. The con you got it all? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my okay. thing didn't export. Uh, can we see oh. Acrobat now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted me to change pages. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. So yeah, these are um, some sample pages of their work that we'll be pulling out of this master document to, to share with clients. Uh, I love in the florals, botanicals, 
submarine type of work. So this project was is technically like a client project, but we wrapped it up into the festival timeline. The interesting challenge about this wall is it's actually a green wall. So plants are uh, desperately clamoring to survive upon it, but I'm not sure if they're gonna be fully fledged uh, green in any point. So there's a wire mesh that went over this entire wall um, and some bits of green kind of like living around in this octopus area, but more or less it's, it's relatively clear uh she's getting pretty close to wrap i think it's day eight for Ana. and Ana, holy smokes like what a what a personality when i had messaged her that the stars had aligned for this project i'm going to give you a call tomorrow unfortunately i got wrapped up into a maelstrom of problems and challenges so i wasn't able to talk to her for another day which i call her and she goes oh my god i haven't slept since like where were you yesterday? And oh my God, I forgot like how crazy awesome these opportunities are for people. And I, yeah, I just, she lost a lot of sleep on my behalf, just <laughs> keeping her so excited for the piece. Um, you see a lot of these color palettes in, in drafts. This one's relatively straightforward, but often you'll see like a paint by numbers te technique uh, thrown down on the actual draft. That way, like they're working with, assistants or production artists, everyone knows where things go and then the artist can just do their best work without having to you know, keep their eyes on whether or not people are putting blue in the blue spots and orange in the orange spots. This is where she's at right now. I think it's much more compelling than the actual draft. Loving the line way, the intensity of the purples are really, really popping off. She's done a fantastic job here. Uh, I wanted to talk about Nada. Nada has been on my radar since ooh, 2018. Would have been introduced from uh, uh, Tom from our team, as well as Jeff Amata from Boom. I've been courting her every year, but she seems to be so busy. And finally, we were able to match her up with a really, really cool client and location. I really am drawn to her work. Just, I kind of have a bit of a dark side when it comes to artwork and her work is uh, can, be, can be quite uh, palatable, but subversive at the same time. I'm playing with a lot of like pop imagery and aesthetics, really beautiful stuff. So the location is in South or on uh, Granville Street. It's 800 Granville, 800 Granville something like this and the stakeholders wanted to represent the robust history of performance and musical acts in Granville so Nada had produced this wildly humongous collage very much in her style of some of the most famous musicians ever and musicians who have dropped down in on Granville Street. Quite a big undertaking, brand new muralist, never painted a wall, works digitally. It's a very common thing to take an artist who's working on a Cintiq or an animation studio and recontextualizing them outside. Bit of a risk when you're asking somebody who's going to be putting themselves into such a new and sometimes uncomfortable zone, but Nada just ran with it and did such a fantastic job. And brick texture is no easy task, so kudos to Nada. All right, now, Jarus, 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 Jarus. I've had a crush on this man for many, many years. I was first introduced to him through my colleague, Scott Sumi, who's a former graffiti writer and also runs Layout, the graffiti paint shop on Franklin Street in East Vancouver. And Scott introduced me to him through this freight work that he does. And I've never seen anything like his photorealism done on freight trains. And he's 
one of the only people who's actually managed to pull it off in a really, really painterly way. The thing with aerosol is that it has a tendency to kind of look like scrubbing with an airbrush. It's just sort of like a filter that goes over things. Whereas Jaris has this ability to dismantle the tool and really use it as though it was a paintbrush and using as big of marks and as tiny of marks and contrasting marks so that it doesn't feel like it's just fuzzed over with an airbrush. So we were looking for a figurative piece, uh, working with the downtown BIA and Natalia was in the creative meeting for this. I was unfortunately not able to make it. And she had this stroke of genius to make this into a collaboration with none other than Marceline Sue, who was an applicant dropped down out of nowhere. I had never heard of her and what an incredible drafts person. She's immaculate narratives, a uh, great sense of composition and tension. We really wanted to work with her. So the wall is really, really big, it's approximately 4,000 square feet. And Natalia had been given some intel from the BIA saying that they were kind of looking for something like historical, potentially working with a narrative or an environment. So I think when we're thinking about environments and we've got this hotshot environment, artist, not that she's exclusively an environment artist, uh, bringing Marceline in and, and do, doing a collaboration with Jara seemed like a really interesting task slash challenge. But yeah, collaborations can be tricky yeah. in the past. I generally only do them when I have sample work that represents like where that collaboration is going to go the only reason I do that isn't because I don't trust the artist to do something fantastic it's actually more to illustrate the potential finish line to the client because not everyone is versed in fine art and murals and it doesn't always it's, it's hard it can be hard to really like imagine um, what things are going to look like if you're not a heavy right brain thinker so thank you BIA for trusting us to put together this collaboration for you. Well, it was because we were putting all kinds of people in front of them and they kept moving back and forth between the two of them. And yeah. I thought, well, I really want to support like these groundbreaking projects for emerging artists. It's like a thing I really believe in and I really believe in mentorship. and. I think like there are certain mentorship opportunities that are kind of transformative for both. And when you see someone like Jaris, whose practice is very established, he has a very established style. And sometimes those people need that push as well. So I was like, oh, this is maybe one of those opportunities. And I was like, this is a totally wild thought. What would you say if we did both of them on the wall? And then they took a chance on us. It was the owners of that building took possession of that building two days before they approved this wall for us to use in the festival. So this was like a huge leap of faith for them and for the BIA to go and decide that, yeah, we can totally put these two people together who have never met because we like the way that their work looks together. So now it looks like that. <laughs> yeah, it was such a good job. Yeah, Marcy, an incredible she's job. She's all digital. And yeah, Jaris did a great job of giving her some, some input, but once she got that brush in her hand, I've been told that she just totally ran with it and uh, was, was painting at a exponentially faster rate than, than everyone's expectations. So watch out, Marceline, you're guaranteed going to be getting more work if you enjoy painting it and painting it so fast. Yeah. And the other cool thing that kind of came out of this is a coincidence, Jaris is based in Toronto and she's actually moving there. Like she's moved there yesterday or something like that. She wrapped up the mural and um, hopped on the plane and went there. So um, this is one of those like really serendipitous, but also thought out and calculated collaborations that I am hoping that we'll be proud of for years to come. And also it's just this now magical green oasis 
on Granville in a way that like it's really, really transformative for that space. And you can see it from all kinds of spots and you can sometimes see just a little bit of Marcillion's green and you can see sometimes a little bit of the figure. And this is um, a friend of Jarrus's that he photographed who lives in the city. So it's also this kind of representation of his network out here in a way. So um, Joe, did you have anything else to say about it? Sorry, there, there was uh, just so many stories on this wall that I felt like I should jump in. No, you should definitely. I mean, a lot of the projects this year were just kind of like a, a lot of alley-ooping to Natalia. Um, and this is definitely one of them where here's a couple artists and then she just slam dunked the hell out of it. So yeah, thanks for filling it in. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it for my three. Uh, I'm going to also mention a thing about Anne, which is that that wall actually is going to have a vine grow over it. And one of the kind of design challenges that we were given on that wall was that this vine net is going to go back over the mural and hopefully will be partly overgrown with a vine, uh, like, um, like an ivy kind of situation. So I'm really excited to see how that pans out as well. Yeah. Uh, Drew, I'm going to get you to name who's going to go next. Lamb. All right. Well, thank you, Drew, for that really good presentation. Can you hear me okay? Can you all hear me okay? All right. So I'm just trying to um, match that. Um, see if I can figure this out as well. With, uh, Let's share a screen. Um, let's see. How do I do this? Okay, so um uh do I need to introduce myself or no? Oh, I'll just quickly. Yeah, that that would be great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, my name is Lam, or Lam Wong. Um, I'm the contemporary artist here from Vancouver, BC. So um, I work at uh, our artists and uh, also has a practice of, as a painter, uh, performance, uh, multimedia, pretty much uh, installation works. Um, and I also work as a curator and um, yeah, doing artists in residency right now at the garden and, uh, and also various different uh, art organizations as well. So I came from a very much a fine arts, contemporary arts background in here. And uh, I joined the VMF only the first time this year. So obviously I have so much to learn and, uh, and I'm still learning actually. And primarily I'm working with uh, Natalia uh, with uh, my projects. And um, so she's been kind of mentoring me and guiding me throughout the whole process. So that was the uh, a very very enlightening experience and much more um, appreciate as well because it's um, um, the whole process is very very different from gallery exhibitions that I'm used to cur curated in my shows and all that stuff and just uh, there's many surprises um, but also like I said it's just it's, it's uh, so much to learn and um, uh, yeah I'm hoping maybe in the future we have time to, uh, again to collaborate um, it will be um, new approaches for sure. So I, I come to understand a lot more about this process right after this few project. Um, so I would just maybe focus on presenting uh, two projects, uh, to, two artists, um, yeah, Marie Coando and Sunny Azu that we finalized for um, this year, so we end up. Um, there's also a few artists that we've been, I have been conceptually working on for a long, long time, uh, but it's somehow um, there's different stakeholders in in the typical VMA project. So um, these artists are actually really famous in the art world, but they somehow the start is not lined up like what you were saying. So they they you know they didn't make it. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly show them as well. Um, going through that, it, yeah, is that okay, Natalia? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I was gonna say that um, I think. 
unrealized projects are often also extremely interesting to talk mm -hmm. about um, okay. as part of these conversations. Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah and I think hopefully... you're going to inspire a couple of questions that I might have later for other panelists as well. So. Great, great, great. So, okay, I'll talk about some of those unrealized projects. We should um, unrealized this year, but we still keeping a conversation with the artists. And then um, they're still interested in working on it. So we might be able to find them a, a great wall in the future or something. We can still, you know, we invited to put that conversation. Uh, so one of the best war uh, that uh, um, I really like from this year's uh, menu. It's uh, the uh, 2233 Columbia Wall, which we call Tall Wall. It's beautiful uh, wall. And then, <clears throat> and as soon as it was like, okay, well, I want this wall. <laughs> and then uh, just on the grace and the tallier, they kind of, yeah, uh, maybe uh, did on this project. So, and this, as soon as I saw it, we, um, I recommend Ian Wallace, and that's kind of how the conversation come about. And as many of you know, uh, Ian, it's uh, hang on, let's just show Ian some. This this is the Ian's work. Uh, so it's back, in particular, this series is called "My Heroes in the Streets." Yeah, and I, Ian Studios is around the corner, and then I thought it would be conceptually wonderful. Or a pedestrian looking at a wall with some pedestrian, which is seen being greatly in the BC art history of a uh, very famous series and creating the kind of a three dimensions uh, conversation. So I thought that was really cool. So I approached Yen, we have a conversation. Um, he's very appreciative. Um, unfortunately, he just doesn't have enough time to, to make the, the deadline, uh, he said, to because to, he, he's very, very, Professionals and spectacular. So, uh, but this is the original idea where you can see it's basically they just like ordinary people on the streets. And what Yen was famous, of course, is combining photography and painting together on large canvases. It's very original work. Uh, one of the really prominent artists from Vancouver as well. So that was that. Um, I'm just getting back here. And then the other. The other war here, it's the, the location, it's, it's this, this thing called Rain and Shines on Canby Street. Um, so there's a two small wall here on which I uh, first is thinking about, um, again, a really good artist, a both famous artist called Michael Morris and Vincent Trussoff. They both are founders of Western Front, which is um, the oldest artist front center here, and they've been making art conceptual art since the 1950s and early 60s. Um, I just carried a show for them a while ago uh, um, called Image Bang, and then the two collaborate with the big retrospective show of Image Bang in Belkin Gallery in UBC, which is still on right now, by the way. If you haven't seen the show, go check it out. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, there's so much of history of art history in Vancouver and also uh, Canada as well, because the the Image Bank created all the huge network with artists all over the world, um, huge network uh, before Facebook and internet and all that. Um, so I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, those idea who's coming up from. This is Michael Morris' work. So um, uh, from early on, there's a series called Concrete Poetry, and those are flat graphic work that I thought would be really cool. So I talked to also, uh, this is also some of his early work as well, uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, concrete portraits uh, uh, print. And his painting is like hard edge uh, uh, optical illusion, but hard edge abstractions, uh, which is, uh, yeah, he's continue uh, painting up to these days actually. So, so uh, but he started it before even I was born, so, you know, early 60s, really. Uh, this is the concept he come up with, it's called Campy Letter, because we were thinking about putting on the Campy walls. Uh, so one of the, one of the wall, um, so he and Vincent Trussoff, which AKA Mr. Peanut, they are sort of so made, they've been making arts together for all their life. Um, and the idea is to pair one of Mr. Peanut's um, work, graphic work with, Michael's painting, so he kind of 
thought about it, created this piece called Can Be Letter, because uh, he has a whole letter series of like Calgary letters and you know, uh, Rome letters and all that stuff. So they are really gigantic painting. And all these paintings also in the show of like Gerard Gary just a little while ago, a few months ago. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, am I? This, this, so this is Mr. Peanuts here, that's Vincent Trussoff. So this is one original idea to pair with his work and Michael's work together because uh, they always see him as duo, as image bang. And uh, I proposed it and then it, Mr. Peanuts kind of proposed it. Uh, they just saying, okay, well, to work with Michael's work, uh, he actually won this thing called Peanut Alphabet. Uh, so, which they create uh, very, very uh, in the early of the career. And um, a lot of conceptual artists, famous conceptual artists, uh, at that time also created this kind of alphabet here. Um, so just let me know if I, I you know, if I time-wise, if you want me to speed up, whatever, feel free to let me know. But I'm kind of getting, going backward here. Uh, what else is I, the other artist I would talk to about the tall wall is uh, Aaron Mecca, which is again, is one of uh, the conceptual artists from Vancouver. Um, he uh, uh, is, AKA Dr. Bruce in that time, they all have their nicknames and you know, they're sort of uh, um, uh, alias uh, personas, alter ego for their um, performance arts and as a conceptual art in the city. And one of the famous things for Eric, it's uh, he created this kind of lapis um pattern and all his arts has been using that as le leopard skin. And one of the major, uh, conceptual direction, it's it's called the real estate uh, leopard skin. And then he actually want to cover the building with all this leopard skin. And he was successful at uh, doing actually a project uh, wrapping the, uh, the leopard skin on the Vancouver Art Gallery then. This is, this is the old Vancouver Art Gallery. And, um, and, and this is almost like 50 years ago. So we kind of want to revive that histories in Vancouver. So uh, so, uh, so I, I proposed Eric and then created conceptually with him uh, to come up with a proposal for the wall. And again, you know, unfortunately, it's just the stakeholders, you know, they all have a different way of working. They, they don't really understand much about the art world and also the history. So, um, at the end, uh, there's also comments about wanting to have an indigenous artist um, on the wall. So um, then for my list of recommendation, um, there's, there's one indigenous artist, it's uh, Sunny Azu. And so at the end, um, I first approached Azu, Azu's wife, uh, Sarah, about this project, but then she said, oh, okay, you know, Sunny is just too busy to take on anything. And thank goodness, Natalia followed up with Sunny and somehow, I don't know what she did or how this, how this is, we talked to him and then we were able to convince him to join us for, uh, for the tall wall for the Columbia. So, yeah. uh, so much great. So you, want, you want to touch on that? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Sonny and I have been trying to work together. I've like written about his work. I've done a studio visit. We're going to do a show. It didn't quite work. So it was one of those like, will they won't they uh in curator artist duos and um i was seeing that he's been super stressed out about losing a lot of his like old digital files as a result of this like computer meltdown situation so i was like hey i understand you're super swamped how is the digital file thing going there's the wall it's a really beautiful wall really want you on this wall but like if it doesn't work it doesn't work look at this wall it's a very nice wall doesn't have to be new work. You don't have to paint it. And then I just like step back and I did this back and forth a few times. And then he was like, oh, got a bunch of files back, have this old piece. I've been wanting to find a new life for it. So this is actually a piece from a number of years ago that he um, completely reimagined for this wall. And uh, we have a production painter, uh, Derek Edenshaw, who actually is a buddy of his who is taking on the painting of it. So it actually has kind of resulted in a collaboration between the two of them. Because he lives on the island, he wouldn't be able, available to go and paint it, so, which he was feeling bad about. But now that it's like going to 
uh, someone within his artist community. And he like he's had a soft spot for Mount Pleasant for a long time. He's lived out here. Um, so this is the piece that we landed on. And I'm so excited for it because I will literally be able to see it out of my office window. There you go. That's a that's a real treat. So yeah, yeah. no, it's incredible. So uh, I am just super stoked and super exciting about this has happened. I think in this case, definitely all stars are lined up here for Sunny, you know, so even though it's a uh, it's very tough timelines, so uh, it's we all make it happen and we all support him and all that. So so we end up having this piece for dancing dance through the uh, while well, the ancestors was watching and uh, uh, very minimal and Sunny's work is kind of a combining pop arts and contemporary arts with a little touch of the history. And of course, all the indigenous issue as well, like sovereignties and colonialism. Just very much. And, but he has this kind of um, uh, sort of play like childlike and pop art approach to the uh, indigenous artist, very fresh. And he is quite a star in the art world as well, um, represented by Equinox. And uh, I'm sure some of you might since his work has been shown in many, many art gallery, you know, doing Vancouver art gallery and Moors and all that. So, and uh, so we just started painting this now. Um, so um, uh, just mapping the projection, try to get the drawings on it. So uh, we have more report in the future. Okay. Um, so these are the color. That and uh, the image of the land there, that's his um, ancestral territory. That's oh, his like ancestral village site. Um, and the other piece that I realized before, and this like probably Sunny doesn't even realize this either, that this space is Jonathan Rogers Park, which when we bring back the big street party in 22, hopefully if mm -hmm. the stars align, it's going to be one of the live sites for the festival. So it's also this kind of like reminder about dance and how dance is sacred because it's this it's really really interesting this interaction between the piece and the park that will also be a, like a live music site so yeah. um stay tuned for the dance parties yeah and you can see the artwork on uh, the creative wise images like the mass is almost like this kind of playful pop art almost like graphic novel type of cartoon approach and the figure you know it's very very playful and um and so this is rendering and we think it looked great on this building. So very, very excited about it. Um, this is another artist called Tomoyo Ihaya. And um, I, pro I, I kind of originally also wanted some female uh, Asian artists, like uh, primary Japanese as well. So I recommended two uh, Japanese artists and Tomoyo is one of them and um, working on the walls of River District. Um, her work is very much about compassion and uh, very uh, minimal palettes that she used to have. And she also used this alter ego the author that's to represent herself in the troubling world. So this is some of her work. Um, very mis uh, mystical, but uh, informed by a lot of it, informed by Buddhism as well, because she's a practitioner. Yeah, but um, <clears throat> you see how nature is and it's all this mythic creatures play in the road there. Okay, and I'm just go back here a little bit more to talk about Marie Paul. Oh. So um, Marie Paul Ando is the other artist. And uh, so apparently everybody loved her work. Uh, she's coming from more um, like sort of illustration. And then she also have this very uh, fantasy like uh, children's meanings um, kind of uh, work. Like Tomoyo, you know, she also have a very limited palette that she express her work. And a lot of her um, subject, it's kind of almost like Alice in Wonderland with all these bunnies and birds and in the wood and all that stuff. So um, what she come up with is this draft for the River District Wall. And again, you know, with the bird and the bunny and the tea party kind of thing. Um, yeah, at, 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 at the center. Um, so it's, it's, 
it's playful, but also mysterious, and also sometimes get a little bit of sort of darkness to it. So um, yeah, but it it he has as she has a very big following. She's so very well known in the Japanese art community, and um, um, yeah, so it's where where Tomoyo is, is more like working on mostly on the residential uh, uh, artists and residents all over the world and all that stuff. Um, but Marie Claude does come well, more like illustration, but also like a pre-making uh, arts background. And I know her for a long time as well, so I've been always seeing her work. So I'm so glad that, you know, she can join us this year. So um, and from this draft, she is now it's painting on the River District wall. So it's coming along. Finally, finally the, uh, the bunny has appeared on the, because uh, the bunny is sort of the focus point. So maybe I'll just wrap up here a couple of frames. So um, um, I, like I said, I, I'm curatorial practice wise, I'm coming from a very contemporary art world. So um, I'm used to the kind of curated for like exhibition shows and kind of have building conversation about artists and artists piece. So this is a very, very different um, approach. And my intention, like, by joining the VMF is I'm hoping to bridge um, this kind of a sort of more commercial art scene to fine art art scenes. Um, so um, Sunday is definitely contemporary artist. So um, coming from that world. So so um, so hopefully you know we can keep the conversation going, and in the future we will have um, success like building project for some of these great artists like. Michael Morris or um, Ian Wallace and, and all that, and Eric McCaff as well, and those are all great. And then, so I have a um, long list of friends that I can think of to suggestion, but um, next year, definitely I will be creating another approach. I, you know, like I won't go ahead and work with conceptually with the artists first, it's, it takes a lot of time, right? Uh, we'll probably just recommend the artists and then have the portfolio to review by different various stakeholders and like once they're selected then they'll come back and then I'll work with the conceptually with the artists. I think that would be helping each other. So that's my experience here. So um definitely learned a lot and I'm very, very grateful. Um I'll conclude my presentation right now unless anybody have Thank you. You get to name the, the next person, but also uh, I just want to thank you for the patience of traversing these very different worlds that I've been um, kind of really embracing this idea of moving between different kinds of art worlds mm. and making that vibrancy and like diversity of different approaches to art making visible yeah. in the city yeah. because we do have this kind of understanding of like the gallery things live over there because they're hard to understand, which they yeah. don't have to be. <laughs> right. And the illustration yeah. things live over there because they're easy to understand, yeah. but there is still a lot of meat and substance and really interesting conversations that happen. Mm -hmm. And then like decorative arts live over there and they don't go on walls. And I'm like, well, no, they do. So there is, all of this really interesting intersection that is happening, including with client work. Yes. So getting clients from the point of, yeah, I just kind of want, I don't know, something abstract <laughs> to then embracing Sunny's work yeah. to like create this iconic piece for Vancouver where right. they now recognize the like kind of the stewardship of what that means to have a piece like that on their yeah. wall. Yeah. And I think it kind of like changes all of our relationship to the city in a really meaningful way. And think so also too. just thinking yeah. about different, completely different audiences, like the River District, when I was curating that set of artists, I was thinking about kids. And yeah. I was thinking about how there's like kids on bikes and what do I want kids of bike on bikes to like, see in this otherwise very like empty and kind of desolate at times landscape that is becoming this new neighborhood. Um, so I think Jazz, you curated a piece there as well as has Jet, uh, uh, Zach. So I've like brought a lot of people together into that little line. Okay, well, how about that?
Hi. <clears throat> My name is Zach George. I'm Skokalem. I was born and raised in North Vancouver. Um, I'm a Coast Salish artist. I work with um, digital art, carving wood, and painting. And I've done a few murals. Um, but to be honest, I'm just uh, a guest curator this year. Like this is my first time uh, experiencing something like this. So I wasn't as quite as prepared as I should have been, but I'm, um, I wanted to come on and log in just to hear your guys' stories as well. Um, Lam and Drew, um, just uh, when you guys speak about curating and helping artists, um, I've learned a lot just in the short little time. You guys, uh, you know, you carry yourselves in a good way and that um, it's infectious. And that's how I feel about art, um, just being a part of this. It's, uh, it's a huge honor to, uh, you know, drive through the city and see these beautiful murals that when I was a kid, they weren't there. So, and when I see them, it, it makes me feel good. And that's the whole purpose of this. Um, I did select a couple artists this year. Uh, one was Simone Diamond Horn, Coast Salish artist, a younger female artist, as well as Jody Broomfield from Squamish Nation. Um, it was important to me to have two Coast Salish artists representing uh, the Lower Mainland because uh, that area is all Coast Salish. So our people are trying to put our art out there more because the, um, our people, uh, our art wasn't out in the public eye as much as it is, uh, say, Haida or uh, Simshian, these places. So our art's just coming to surface lately. And uh, it, it means a lot to, I talk to people all the time, Coast Salish people, and it means the world to them to be acknowledged and be a part of this. And it's an important thing, uh, what you guys are doing. Uh, I don't know if I'm on the right topic here. I just kind of started rambling on. <laughs> But, of course you are. And yeah. um, I am just sharing a couple of links to the artists that you're mentioning. And okay. if you want, I can also share screen if you want to um, share images or you can share screen from your end. Um, so what, whatever you want to do. Okay. You, you don't yeah. have to either. People can just go and look at them uh, from the links that I'm, I'm putting up as well. Okay. No, that's good enough. I like to keep things short and sweet. And also Jody's project is very special because that one is, well, all of them are extremely special. But the thing about Jody's project is that that piece is the beginning of a series of works that will be on those alleyways off of Denman Street that went through a naming process a while ago and were named after significant people often underrepresented in Vancouver's history. So the curatorial approach that we took to it is we wanted to do images or like murals on these alleyways that reflect those communities with how they are active still in the neighborhood today. So Zach, that's why it was really important that that piece uh, that I kept bringing C. Swice into the conversation because it is actually her ancestors who lived there that it is actually her great, 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 great grandmother that the laneway is named after. Mm. Um, Samia and that's and I, I've been sending her photos of like in progress shots of um, Jody's piece because that is like very much positioning it right there at English Bay and kind of to looking to this time before it was Vancouver. Um, so 
you can like see Stanley Park in it. And, uh, you can see the piece on his uh, Instagram and then uh, Crystal's Mermaid because it's right next to Fraser River and she's got like family history of, um, I think she said it was her father that felt like he was um, like um, pulled down by mermaid and how like mermaids are actually kind of ominous creatures. And I'm like, yeah, they sure are. <laughs> and she said that there has not yet been a Coast Salish mermaid mural done anywhere. So she was, she was the first one. Yeah, Crystal, yeah. I like her work. Yeah, yeah, she's got a lot of flow with her work. Totally. Yeah, so. And that's yeah. her first mural as well, as well as yeah, that, that's cool. Definitely not Jody's. Jody got that out in like four days. It was the fastest of yeah. all the murals we've done this year. He's awesome. Yeah, you learned that from me. No, nice. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about the projects that you've been doing as an artist in the festival as well? Because you've been doing a couple of projects um, as an artist as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, right now, I'm uh, currently working on planters, and uh, I'll be down there Saturday and Sunday to really get going on them. I started one, and it's uh, it's a different experience uh, being on the sidewalk, and uh, you know, a lot of people want to stop and talk to you and there's a lot more distractions. So I was just uh, trying to uh, work my way through that the first couple of days, because I, I like to stop and talk to people as well, right? And, uh, you know, but it, it's it's interesting because the people I see down there, um, they're, you know, a lot of them are really suffering, you know, a lot of addicts, uh, mental health issues. So it's, um, it's a humbling experience, yeah, being down there for sure. I uh, to be in areas like that, I, I'm I'm never afraid. I just uh, sometimes my heart gets heavy for them. Just uh, you know, you see some guy standing there uh, talking to himself or what have you. But then they get drawn to the art that I'm doing. So just for that minute or so, they're distracted into what I'm doing. And they forget things for a minute, which to me that's uh, that's big, you know, just to have that break for a little short time. And um, it's uh, I'm going to work deeper into the um, East End as well too. So this is uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll be bumping into more people, but it's uh, it's a place I I don't mind being, and I you know. When I was a young kid, this is kind of a little off topic, but my dad, he went down and he spent four days on a bench in Pigeon Park. And he, uh, he just sat there in prayer and he fasted and he was just doing it for the homeless people around them, the alcoholics, the addicts, whoever wanted to sit with them. And he said, you know, by the end of it, end of the four days, there'd be like a hundred people sitting around with me. And he, um, so this brought me back to that. And I think, you know, these things when I'm painting, and, uh, to me, that carries a lot of our own history. You know, he was always uh, doing things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that is such a meaningful project. And then you, you were just, the right person for it when I called in I was like yeah but you know it's downtown inside so we don't always uh sometimes we approach our desk and they're not quite comfortable painting there on the street and you're like no no that sounds great I'm I'm down I'm down there so yeah. um next week I'll uh, go give you a hand out there as well and help out paint some planters if anybody wants mm -hmm. to volunteer we're looking for some volunteers to help finish the few planters because Zach has been helping out in Lytton so indirectly I feel like we'd be helping out in Lytton if we were to come and paint some planters with him so holler and I'll Thank set you. you up with the time and the connection yes so um 
Oh, where is that? Yes, I will. Sorry, I'm, we're getting a few questions, but the questions are coming to hosts and panelists. So I'll just I'll answer that um, in a bit. But um, so you get to pick the next person with Jazz. <laughs> Who, who's on here? Uh, Jazz. Jazz is Jazz. the last one remaining. I, I, sorry, I can't see her name. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go for I, it. Thanks, yeah. Dad. Good, good yeah. evening, everyone. It's been so great to hear um, what everyone's been getting up to, as we've never really like spoken since our one of our first meetings, how many months ago. So it's lovely to see everyone and see that all the projects are coming into fruition. So. Um, yeah, so my name is Jazz and I'm the uh, 2021 guest curator for Murals in the Market, which is a collaboration between Vancouver Mural Fest and the Punjabi Market Regeneration Collective um, at Punjabi Market, which is at Maine and 49th. Um, before I go any further, I will get this. Oops. Going. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. So um, this is Markets in the Mural and um, the goal of the Punjabi Market Regeneration Collective um, is to bring outdoor um, public art to beautify and to activate the neighborhood of Maine 49th and the two or three streets that are um, around Maine and 49th for more foot traffic as there was a great period where Maine 49th was really activated with community um, and people coming down to see um, friends and to buy clothing and food and just visit. And this was also an area where um, new immigrants to the country would come and this is where the diaspora would be all together um, and things changed over the years and so some people lost contact with the community and moved abroad um, and so I was asked to come on board and um, select some artists who their work um, would bring this vibrancy back to the community um, and so um, this is the first year that murals were introduced to the market um, and I was asked to select a diverse range of artists and so the way that I went about it was that I met with um, the building owners, um, which was interesting at times as well and I was thought that we would have, a, you know, with their four walls um, and that would be all diverse and I was like really gung-ho and then all of a sudden um, it was like, well, actually we would like this type of work and this type of work and I was like, yes, obviously, because you know, your part, um, three out of the four building owners are have South Asian background and heritage. And so obviously they wanted something that um, invoked a memory for them, nostalgia. And that became really important as well. This feeling of nostalgia of how Maine and 49th was back in the days and, and how it started. And the building owners, three out of the four were like, we would like a connection to that again. And so then I had to kind of reshift and um, work and select artists and reach out to see who'd be a good fit and that process I really enjoyed because I personally learned so much about um, other South Asian artists in the community that I hadn't and other artists as well um, and so the, the idea of community is what held um, this project together and I feel like just before the process of it starting everyone having all the artists having their own memory of being on Maine in 49th and what that meant to them and then having the conversation with the artists as well um, and the building owners and everything really came and gelled really nicely and I feel like each artist um, brought a diverse background or aspect of South Asian heritage to their work and so therefore the diversity in that really was um, hit, hit hard with the community as well as something that they really enjoyed and wanted to see as well. And so I'll just speak a little bit about the artists and their works. I will say that all the murals have been completed and um, so please go down to take a look when you can. Um, and so the first artist we worked with was Diamond Point. Um, Diamond's work uh, really actually gelled with um, the owners um, at the Orb development in that, in that area, there were streams once and actually one stream exists underneath the building that the, comf uh, the, the development has decided to keep as well. So it's really cool to learn that history. And um, the building owners really wanted something that was vibrant and water-based and that was really up Diamond's um, style. And she, um, what she came up with is this 
three strand braid that kind of flows through the mural and then you have the salmon coming together um, and this was all about the community coming together as well um, the building um, is full of um, new and um, diverse people from all over the world and the lower mainland and so that one point of connection within the community that is already so diverse as well really bridged with her work and the theme of blue and water that really connected again with not only what the um, building owners wanted, but with what um, Diamond was doing as well. So I thought that was a real successful um, bridging of two people's thoughts coming together on this giant wall, which is amazing. And so the mural location is there at 6509 Main Street, Vancouver. Um, the second artist that um, was brought onto the project is Gandhi Gandaj Deep Singh and um, for his mural um, the building owner really wanted something that was reminiscent of what Punjab um, in, in India um, in the fields was like um, this very nostalgic moment of the harvest festival that accumulates in Vasaki which is the celebration of the ending of the harvest festival and Gandaj um, when I was looking at his work was is beautiful dream like skies and I was like that is the feeling I think that um, Uncle Tour who's the building owner really wanted to show he wanted to see um, what what one was doing on the land um, this combination of celebration and these colors that um, Gandaj was able to invoke um, were just really everything that came together um, and Gandaj also has three panels and it shows the first, this is one of the main panels where the gentleman is in traditional dance clothes and he's singing and the woman is churning butter and then there's a scene in, in the back where there's an ox pulling um, in, in, the, in the field for the harvest and there's some kids in one of the walls that are playing and the colors that he's been able to use I think um, have this very romantic moment, but also this nostalgic moment. And it was important for the building owner to see what it was like, what life was like in Punjab at one point. And um, this mural is also part of like where the food market is as well. So it was really interesting how Gintaj was able to tie everything together um, within that scope. And then our one of our third walls um, is by the two artists, Minal Bakari and Mastali Raj, uh, it's a husband, um, wife couple and um, Manal is a designer and Masali works in graphic design so what they are able to bridge together their artistic styles and interest into this beautiful architectural rendition of um, an interior of an old palace and their wall and one of the reasons why I was really drawn to um, their work um, and is that Minhal is also a jewelry designer. And so the wall that this uh, mural went behind um, is of, of a jewelry store. So it was really interesting that the um, artist and the um, Darshna auntie who owns the building store um, were able to come together in this one moment um, and come up with this beautiful three-dimensional um, archway with these beautiful shapes that are reminiscent of old air old India um, jewelry design, but also done in this very contemporary way as well, because that was also um, a way that one of the ways that they were able to bring this new take on traditional design as well and interpret it in their own artistic styles. And um, then we worked with Sandeep Johal, who was um, a senior mural artist. And it was really important for me to reach out to Sandeep and to have her be part of this project because as a South Asian woman, she's done such a great job of breaking the barriers of fem for female South Asian artists to be artists and living and working artists. And so to give back um, to her for doing that for our community and then for to have her included in this project was very meaningful for me as well. And she's just a lovely person to be around as well. So um, it was great. And the wall that Sandeep had was the Himalaya restaurant, which has been their main important for ages. And one of the memories um, that even Sandeep had was coming earlier in the years and um, seeing this great line of sweets that was in the restaurant. And so that really was like a positive trigger memory for everyone as a child growing up and coming and seeing all these sweets and the possibility of eating all of them. And so her letter, a uh, love letter to Machai, which means sweet, was seen here. And um, so for her, she showed two giant trays of, um, of sweets 
piled high in, um, in her um, typical vibrant color here as well. Um, and the shapes were also reminiscent of some of the shapes that echoed in the restaurant as well. And it's, um, it's, done, it's been such a great process to see all the artists come together from like, you know, three of the artists, for the artists of the vibe artists not ever painting a mural and, and learning through that um, and then the artists um, the artists learning about the community and the stories that were told by not only by the landowners but the um, the air uh, the, the aunties and uncles who would take their evening walk and anyone who would stop by and and start talking um, and I think that really made this whole process even more meaningful for the artists and for myself as well and um, you know the murals fully accessible vibrant colors they have their own stories but it's also now a new generation of artists and and young people are coming back to the market you know they're bringing their families and friends who possibly haven't been to Maiden 49th ever or in a long time and you know social the help of social media is regaining um this hold on the market again and as I was there for like weeks going in and out and I could personally feel um the change um in the feeling and in the air you know that there's excitement um and so this this is just one of the projects that has come up and hopefully more will come um, soon and I think overall it's been a great experience for the artists and also for the community and the building owners of education around contemporary art and um, the styles that are all depicted there and how art doesn't have to be one different thing or one thing you know it is assortment and a feeling and a desire and a passion and that's all come together I think very successfully in the murals so if you haven't been down yet, please go down, take a look, stop in at the shopkeepers and say hi. Um, yeah, there's lots happening now in, in, in Maine and 49th. So yeah, and I was so pleased to be part of this project and it's all come together. So thank you. Um, I don't know who I'm supposed to hand it off to, but. I, I think it's just me left, but oh. I, I, I was going to ask you because Jazz, you also, have you done a lot of public art curatorial work before, or was this kind of an entrance into this for you as well? Yes, this was an entrance. So like Lam mentioned, and Zach too, there's a lot of learning experiences that happen. Yeah. Um, but it's all about listening and understanding and kind of being like, okay, yeah, so this might not work this year, but maybe we can you know, table that for next year. Yeah, and it's really interesting because also one of your artists landed on a uh, River District wall. I knew. New, yes. And yeah, and um, that piece is very much like targeted for kids and to like shift kids' imagination of kind of what princesses are yes. basically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have an image of it kicking around? I have one. Um, I'm afraid I don't. Okay, hold on. I, I, I do because I was just pulling up the River District, my old deck that I used. Hold on, I'm just gonna do that. Nope, that is not what I want to do. Um, and it's just a very interesting conversation to be having around sort of how audience shapes the work and how that doesn't have to be a bad thing if we listen closely and listen to the parts of it that really speak to the neighborhood and the place. Um, I think there is this initially a hesitation of like, oh no, there's going to be so many cooks in the kitchen. And sometimes, hell yes, so many cooks in the kitchen. They want so many things. Like the, I think the most absurd request I've ever heard has been like to combine absolutely unimaginable things into one thing, including like dogs and cats and this and this and this and this and this. And then the artist pulls it out and it's like the perfect thing for the neighborhood and completely lands. Um, so it's kind of, you know, this continual level of surprise, um, but also it's the people who's gonna have to like live with this art and talk about it. Um, but I'm gonna share um, my screen from here to show you other piece. And Chrome. Oh, that's gonna be my email. You don't want to see that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
could totally do that. There you go. Um, do you want to talk about her art practice a little bit, Jess? Because I feel like it's such an interesting um, illustration of how these um, ideas come together. Sure, sorry. No, um, yeah, so originally I was really attracted to Anu's work. Um, she is graphically and digitally doing these really amazing things and it was and she also um, illustrated um, in one of the books that I saw and that's kind of where I thought, saw her work and I was like who holds such characteristics to like South Asian culture as well but is able to blow them up not in a traditional way in in their own understanding of contemporary digital work as well and so um, and and it is so beautifully thought through and just like you said that the um, connection to children and the vibrancy, but the little details that are included. I think um, she does a really great job in understanding and listening to those and bringing everything in. And um, I was really a fan of her color palette as well that she's been able to use and work with as well. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um... It's interesting because I, I started thinking the River District, um, Lam, like you talked about how um, Mariko landed there as well. Uh, it's this series of panels that are like, Drew, what are they like nine by 30? So they're like this kind of an odd dimension, um, but one that is really conducive to like walking through. So I conceived the whole thing as a garden path but also as a little bit of like a fairy tale because I have a four-year-old so all I think about when I'm not here is princesses so I was like how would I want to create this world that kids can really lose themselves in the imagination at the same time as having all of these like um pieces from contemporary art and like conversations about identity, conversations about space, conversations about land and um, sovereignty and myth and environment, all of that while still having that kind of wonder world feel to it. So I'm, I'm really excited. You guys should definitely go check it out. Um, yeah, I think that's a, re that's a really, really good comment. So, like, you know, bringing the kids out and enjoy the arts in the fresh air. Like, you know, the one of the yeah. strong thing about arts in the old, in the public space in the, like the like VMF murals, like it's like when there's a reason you can convince your child, your, your, your kids to come out for bike ride or go for a walk by the river and see all this beautiful art, you give them a chance to be away from iPad. And yeah. Whatever. And also be like, what do you think is going on? Because we're putting in all of these things that we know they recognize, you know, like Alice in Wonderland, exactly. Rapunzel. Yeah. It's know. also really show, show inspiring space for them. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I, I think it's just anything to get them away from iPad, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so we are at 718. Let's do a quick round of ask each other a question. I'm gonna mm, I'm gonna maybe start off and ask Jazz just because we've all touched on this question a little bit in all of our conversations, which is what was your biggest unrealized project this year? But you can actually think like further outside of that. And that's the case for all the questions. They don't have to be about this year. It's really just like us as curators sharing stories. So biggest unrealized project. Ooh. <laughs> um, with, within this framework of the mural project or whatever you want whatever. however you want to treat the question the question is yours I've thrown it to you it is yours now to decide um so I'm on a few uh boards um as my extracurricular activity and I think one of them um is working with a diverse range of artists in the visual and performing arts as uh, performing arts as well. And um, for example, at the Richmond Art Gallery Association High Tea, we did a drag night, which was amazing. And I think taking upon that um, with hopefully when rules relax, I would like to move into something more um, performative as um, more performative. I think I'm really wanting to work with more performing artists. Um, and seeing how we can interpret them in a gallery space um, where you can have a, a multifaceted experience. 
So not working with an individual, uh, one particular artist or anything, but the bigger concept of how we can take kind of like an auction frame and, and um, bring it more to life and more unique experiences. And now you um, get to come up with a question and bounce it to the next person. Oh, okay. I was gonna, um, I would like to take that question, I think, and bounce it to Lam. Uh, well, unrealized project. Um, I, I kind of go through that in my presentation, <laughs> I, I guess. Um, but like I mentioned a little bit earlier, I don't really see them as a, uh, unrealized project. I, I see them be just, you know, like the time constraints or whatever, um, uh, you know, when the lines, the stars not line up, but we still having the conversation going, right? The way I see our practice is always an ongoing thing. It, it's it never really like to start and end and that's all. And artists are very, very open-hearted and open-minded. So, um, so I would say, you know, uh, I always try to propose we will, keep on going and looking for uh, new walls and that may be even better for their work. And then and one of the things that Talia and I dis discuss is maybe um, they also using the opportunity of Winter Festival and using some new technology like augmented reality and uh, image wrapping projection or something like that. And also in those cases, the creator might have a bit more freedom and powers uh, in, in in discussing with um, uh, with the artists and realize the project, uh, so the hurdle may be a bit uh, less. Um, but because I'm new to the uh, uh, the, the public arts and VMF uh, curatorial wise, so um, so there there was there's quite a few of uh, unrealized projects this year. Um, I. Mm, it's really hard to say which one is the the, the, the biggest though. Uh, maybe um, I I guess I when we first started the conversation, I was really excited about Ian Waters' uh, project, and and he was he was up for it. Just there's not enough time to prepare for it. So um, so between that and Eric's uh, like. Uh, uh, the leopard skin because like everybody have a different idea about what leopard skin is and they uh, most people don't know the history of Vancouver and West Coast uh, conceptual arts history there's so much meanings and so much work that he you know he do with those identities and patterns um and um and and Eric is very excited about it actually actually about the project so we were having a really exciting um conversation about it and uh hoping it would happen so um so yeah maybe between those two it's uh yeah i i, I would say it's my thing so um should i ask my question um well, well, now you okay. now you come up with a question i'm gonna make you do a new one uh and bounce it to the next person um yeah i i hmm, wow i love to actually I asked both Zach and Drew that uh, <laughs> now I have to make a choice. Um, maybe maybe uh, just because uh, for practical pragmatic reasons, I really want to have a more heart to heart conversation with Zach really about you know the, uh, the, the, the structure in downtown East Side because I, I, I used to live there as well because so I have a lot of experience and I'm also work there right now. That's kind of my home uh, in terms of creative space. So. Uh, uh, but I mean, you know, maybe that's another occasion that I do want to have a heart to heart uh, conversation. And I'm, I'm working with a lot of probably indigenous artists right now. It's a lot of exchange. This new painting show coming up with Orange Paul as well. And so there's a lot of um, touch, touch issues about uh, solidarity, uh, colonialisms, and um, uh, residential schools, well, of, of course. So, so all those things, I think uh, I, I really want to have a deeper, uh, you know, and chance to write, but maybe I'll just ask you a question, more pragmatic question in terms of um, uh, v v VMF. So um, uh, we, I guess the process of the, in terms of VMF, this this idea of kind, a like stakeholder way right, to make this, and like I said, this is very different from what I'm coming from, because uh, most of the time the 
curators would, and the artists would go and the content and make things happen and, and, and that's all. So would you see maybe in the future will be, um, there's any chance for this kind of environment will be kind of uh, servicing somehow, uh, like, you know, um, yeah, allow uh, some of the curator and artists more uh, freedom to create in terms of going through all these presentation and pitchings and, 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 and all that. So yeah, I'm just curious about that because that will allow a lot of fine art artists a much more creative space. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it varies year to year um, who's, who's gonna be putting money forward and what kind of flexibility is, is given. Mm -hmm. I can, I have a, a hard time picturing a utopic, utopic sort of uh, gallery-esque kind of curatorial process. Um, one can only wish. I certainly uh, thought I was doing the Lord's work back in 2016 and I was just full of steam and ideas and I learned very, very quickly that that's not really the case. Um, and I think, you know, every year has its batches of carte blanche or pseudo carte blanche curatorial um, options. I think, you know, coming from more of like a illustrative representational graphic design kind of background, um, that those type of artists can be like a little bit easier to place just because, you know, it's not about um, you know, historical context or conceptual thought um, and, you know, like experimentation in mediums. I think the, uh, a, a lot of the time, like palatability is, is, is part of the equation here. So mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about an artist like Ian Wallace, who's brilliant and deserves, you know, all of the representation um, possible, especially in the public sphere it can be a little bit challenging to sell that to, you know, a, a, a group of stakeholders or clients that, you know, don't really have that kind of education. So, yeah, I, all I can say is I hope, <laughs> and it certainly is sort of like luck of the draw when, when it comes to who's coming forward, but you know, we certainly want to be able to give guest curators an environment where, you know, they can do that. Um, I'm equally upset about Eric Metcalf. I've got mm -hmm. some of his reproductions and he's been on my like dream hit list for some time. So I think um, there's certainly going to be some opportunity in the future for, for you to help, uh, you know, see that. Um, Realized, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So well, th thank you for saying that. Really, really uh, appreciate that. One of the really positive things I learned is actually, um, you know, obviously all these big art stars, they deserve, you know, um, a representation in the sort of space in the city. Uh, uh, but I, 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 what I can sense is they actually wanted to do it. They excited about the project. So that was a really, really positive thing because they, they, you know, a lot of them, they don't really, say they don't say no like you know they actually say yes right so and and they they realize you know they could be part of this this you know this culture and this you know and um and i, I think that's a wonderful thing onward in the future to have that kind of conversation and dialogues and collaboration so um and yeah i think that's that's a really wonderful thing to make them feel really vibrant and, and um, parents were different kind of artists to be in, so. Definitely. And like, I also don't want to perpetuate, uh, you know, the, the more lowbrow stuff and encourage, you know, more and more triangle and flower murals everywhere and, mm -hmm. and sort of like push these important contemporary artists aside. And I think what the work that you're doing be it you know just the very beginning is very very important um for vancouver's history thank you that's a good conversation i really appreciate that okie doke um what do we got so zach remains
fascinating, right? Hmm, Zach, what surprised you the most this year? Hello, got yeah. me. What surprised me the most this year? Um, for me, I guess just working with uh, the fellow curia curators, um, just their, uh, how helpful and uh, patient they've been um and uh just the opportunities and uh how passionate you guys are for your work i'm just amazed listening to you guys talk about um you know trying to move artists forward and bring new artists in and uh it's just uh yeah just your guys passion behind what you do is what's what's uh, really impressed me. And I, um, I hope to take a little bit of your guys' words that you've shared tonight and just uh, carry that further into what I'm doing. So yeah, thanks. I think you're also very inspirational as well, Zach. Like, you know, for whatever the words you're saying, there was a um, strong sense of compassion and empathy coming out from there, um, I think that that is above art, really. That's just much more higher plane spiritually. And uh, uh, I, 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 I really felt that too. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to toss mm -hmm. what surprised you the most to Natalia, who is, <laughs> been at the helm of all of this crazy business our first mega year running the show um oh so many things so many things um that's it's a, it's a very good question and when you asked it to zach i started thinking i was like surprised me and I think it's, first of all, the combination of how incredibly flexible artists are, like flexible, committed to their practice, willing to like be out there in extremely often hostile conditions. That's the other thing that surprised me is just how incredibly hostile public spaces. I think I'm, I've been spoiled in my gallery world and the like large scale installation world in often remote places where it was like, oh yeah, plumb the thing down. Everyone loves it. Okay, thanks, bye. But here it's like really the embeddedness in really the, like how this brings the city and the artists together in a really profound way that is way beyond what the artwork is. So it's the combination of jazz, like what you were saying with aunties and uncles out there walking and like feeding Merlis. We've had so many business owners feed so many people this year. Oh my God, people have been very well fed. Um, so everything from that to having to really work through the complexities of working in, um, the Chinatown Hogan's Alley area and downtown kind of with the homelessness, with the, like the housing crisis, the addictions crisis, everything is really heightened when you're working in public space for an extended period of time. So it's not really necessarily that it surprised me, but I think what surprised me is the resiliency that comes with that and the incredible work that our tech crew does through all of that, just with a smile on their face and being like okay well that is a new thing that i've never seen before happen so we're gonna deal with that one today um so i think that um and just the incredible of that kind of what you said care and love that goes into all of this stuff um and also how flexible clients often are where they start off again being like i want some triangles and flowers and then they end up with like what is essentially like a land back piece and they're like that sounds great so 
that's that's been very cool. Um, should we do? And that, I'm gonna put a question to. Um, so maybe I'll just answer this question because Mary Ho um, messaged in the Q and A, asking about ownership, and that's a question that's very complex around mural work. But the summary of that is that it belongs to the artist. The image and the work belongs to the artist, um, and people can't like take a photo of it and then reproduce it and sell it for their own financial gain. That's still like the copyright, the, there is a word that I'm looking for. Um, like the moral rights to the image always stay with the artist. Hope, hope that answers the question, Mary. Otherwise it is paint on the wall and it belongs to whatever other things are attached to the building. We are um, supported partly by the mural support program from the city of Vancouver, which um, asks for a commitment to um, holding the murals up for two years. So I guess they kind of have a stake in that too, but not really an ownership stake. Yeah. Um, Drew, do you want to talk about ownership a bit? Because I'm sure you've like fielded a million of these questions through uh, your work with VMF. A little bit. I actually had an interaction with a very well-known car rental company uh, who was taking a bunch of photographs of my work and a bunch of other people's work. And then it just turned into this Instagram like bonfire. And fortunately, there were a brand who was really receptive to it. I mean, the brand was really trying to uh, um, circle themselves around like the arts community so they're parking their vehicles in front of these walls and they got called out really really bad for a couple of days and uh yeah it gave me like a really really um authentic apology and offered to figure out you know what kind of discourse they should do uh with what they've done and then also what they should do moving forward you don't always encounter companies that are going to be you know so um, nice, but it was, uh, yeah, it was kind of refreshing to see that happen. There's a very famous case in the United States um, with Mercedes Benz two years ago, who were, it was Greg Mike, a couple like big pop surrealist muralists in, I want to say Detroit. And it went to a big lawsuit against Mercedes, Mercedes countersued. Uh, the group of artists and everyone went to town on them online and they eventually settled out of court um, Mercedes um, paying up the artists. Um, I don't know what some that worked out to. Uh, you've also got a big lawsuit right now with an artist named Futura who's sort of like a godfather of uh, graffiti and that is between North Face, who is using his Atom Atomic icon as brand labeling. And I think that uh, case is still ongoing. That's more just plagiarism, not in public space. Um, I don't know. I get a lot of phone calls and emails about people inquiring about, you know, use of murals and things. And unless you're like, I don't know the Warner Brothers or something like I generally just like let it slide it, it'll often be like you know student documentaries nonprofits, people you want to just give them the artwork but yeah other than that I don't think I've faced anything too too crazy uh, when it comes yeah. to stealing people's work but I'll certainly uh, go to bat for anyone uh, when that those kind of problems arise yeah and um we also often get all of these questions about artwork on stuff. Uh, Carfac has really great resources. It tells you how much to pay artists based on what kind of thing, how large is this thing, how many of this thing are you making, are you making money off of this thing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It actually goes into much more detail than it did a few years ago. So like if let's say you wanted to print an image of one of the murals on a tote bag, whether that's commercial or not. Commercially, um, there's like 
a fee structure that's set based on the number of reproductions. So for anyone that's curious, uh, it's a good, good dive into that. Um, so actually, I also have an interesting story about ownership, which is uh, not from this organization, but I used to be with the Vancouver Biennale and the um, Giants mural that is on Granville Island on the silos there even though that was partly sponsored by Oceans Concrete. Oceans Concrete actually did not chose to because they wanted to save money to not buy the reproduction rights for that image. And the artists were very adamant that they would have to pay substantially more in order to be able to reproduce this as part of their marketing. So Oceans Concrete is actually not allowed to use this as part of their marketing materials. Um, so what it Instead, they ended up doing with painting these trucks that roll around looking like cabbages or, you know, what, what other fruit to be associated with the mural without actually having to reproduce the mural. So that's how we get the cabbages and carrots rolling around. Um, does anybody have any other questions for anybody else? Uh, I have a question. I have a quick so question. Um, so since we talk about surprises, um, and anybody can feel free to answer this. Is this, uh, this ever happened that any work that has gone too far? And I am, I'm touching a point of the censorship. But is there any kind of trouble with uh, the city of Vancouver? Or any public rhyme media uh, attacking and they or just kind of go under the censorship umbrella that it's just gone too far kind of thing? That's ever happened. We had a we had an artist very well-known Austrian muralist living in the U.S. I won't say their name, but they do exploded illustrated things, so illustrated mm -hmm. diagrams, and we had them placed on the back of the Fox Theater, and they submitted a draft of an exploded baby fetus that uh, we did not want to even consider submitting for uh, public approval because it certainly would not get approved, but also the design itself was not their best work, um, to put it lightly. And they also generally play to a lot of like pipe uh, pop uh, icons when doing this, these kind of exploded diagrams, very palatable. But they decided to take a total left turn and uh, pretend they were a punk rocker and they got the boot. So, yeah, there was that. Um, I don't know. One thing that we usually say with artists, like when we're talking about uh, drafts and approvals, like, you know, just no sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or no sex, drugs, and violence. We can have rock and roll for sure. <laughs> um, but the yeah they generally are, are, are pretty like careful about that and i think like with the city the only thing that like really can get kind of strange is like in my mind cultural appropriation um mm. but with artists they get a little nervous about you know these drafts and being like oh what if they don't like pink what if they don't like green well you know the city isn't allowed to let anyone pipe in subjectively on on colors um or subject matter as long as it's not like breaching those um you know those more um edgier kind of motifs you know i always joke that just make sure there's no boobs and negative shapes and clouds and things <laughs> mm. uh, i've heard of a story where uh, a strata had actually teamed up and petitioned against a wall because it was bright pink and that wall eventually i think either went got declined entirely or they changed the color but uh, that's one of the few if only times i've ever heard of a design get declined mm -hmm. um due to public demand so what about like political statements anything like touch the sensitivity of political statement like that kind of thing like you no know, let's say uh, you can like paint something with words and statements like uh residential schools to the cultural genocide, something like that, like, that, like, that kind of thing, if that ever happened. 
Yeah, we worked with an, a street artist named Indigo uh, Shalom Johnson our very first year. And there were some wild riots somewhere, I forget where. Mm -hmm. It is mural design about the riots and police brutality and flames. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we lied to the city to get it through. It was like, we just needed to, there, it was like a party and cops had shown up, but it was very much about like police, police brutality and these riots that were happening in the States. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, we kind of kind of like circumvent approvals to kind of make that happen. Uh, and at the time we were also like dealing with graffiti and graffiti was like not a thing that we were allowed to do. So we were allowed to do temporary facades. So we were calling like whole buildings, temporary facades in order to like get things pushed through. But yeah, I can't, I can't think of anything that was like hyper, hyper political that's been declined or standing out in my mind right now. Thank you. Uh, there should be a place for that, and I do want to see more of it. Um, again, it's just time and place and stakeholder and location that is going to going to allow for something like that. You got to get you got to get through the whole discovery meeting shortlist curatorial process with the client to kind of like get through to that and. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I can't think of a lot of folks who are putting that work out there that's in our Rolodex right now. So I would be good to build on that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And especially because of course, like Norales have such an incredibly polit politically activist history, like that is something that is like so integral to the history of like public art and especially public art that's on walls. So absolutely, I think that's um, a very important growth point for us. Um, any more questions for the, from the audience? Um, I think we can probably wrap up a little bit early, if not, uh, and let people be on their merry way. Um, I have some show and tell. Oh, yeah? I have some show and tell. Go for it. Okay. Bear with me, here we go. Okay, so one of the projects that we were working on this year, uh, yeah. super hot and fast. And I've, I've painted with the fest a couple times, but seen you know, 300 plus project come to fruition. And I think this year was the year that we go, okay, let's, let's put my name in the hat for this one and, and see what happens. We put together a really, really, exciting curatorial um, package and it's very grateful to have been chosen um, by Boza for this project so it's at uh, 1500 Georgia Street it's going to be uh, converting its address to 1515 Alberni it's a development by Boza and it is a 11,000 square foot pool adjacent to a 3,000 square foot wall of hoarding it's, all these murals are temporary I was giving a brief sort of like a reflection is uh, one of the adjectives that they used for it. Uh, they wanted to have the architect's vision somehow embedded in it. And this year I've been working with a number of developers and figuring out how um, my mind and an architect's mind can grow together and by using Art Deco, cantilevers, architectural features as a method of collaging uh, the imagery it was sort of like what I've been working on this year that allowed me to sync up with the vision of Ole Sheeran, who's a very well-known architect who's developing the property at 1515. So we finished on Sunday and accrued approximately 1400 hours in production uh, we had a all-star team of seven of us total and right now we we're working with a big bottleneck of production artists we're 
working on producing the Douglas Copeland installation down in the West End. So we've got, you know, some of our all-stars down there. BSRP required a number of production artists. And so I was kind of having a head scratch as to like, who are we going to bring into this thing? So I was pulling artists from uh, the film industry as scenic artists. I was pulling in uh, one an all-star muralist um, and art production artist, uh, Oksana Gadeshiva, as well as very well-known graffiti writers, commercial painters, and artists around the town. And I branded our team the Doom Unit because we're just here to destroy and uh, yeah, so I just went down there to get some initial captures of it today. Uh, the hoarding honestly was the most complex piece, just given the uh, the sort of ratio. It means you have to fill a lot of, you have to have a lot of elements in order to go so horizontal um, and it wrapped around the corner onto Nicola here. A lot of interesting breakthroughs um, for me as a painter, uh, a lot of interesting breakthroughs for the team because not everyone is a photorealist. We actually only had one artist who is more or less a photorealist, which is Oksana. And so everyone kind of got to take a stab at their photorealism and sort of like alley-oop me to come back over and destroy their work or amplify their work, break edges, work on colors, et cetera. So yeah, the hoarding, Hoarding was, uh, was one thing, but the main event is the pool. There it is. It's called the bathing dyad, the idea of pairs and partnership and fraternal relationships. The whole property is a is someone's future home. And I thought about you know the the coupling of family units and then also pairing that with these sort of cantilever forms uh, and that reflects Ole's work. The pool needed to be painted in a pool paint, which is an interesting compound. It's very rubbery. It turns into elastics if you let it dry, which in a heat wave was happening all the time. We had to move really, really quick. The event started yesterday. So we had to wrap before then, have the chlorinated pool filled in and the site cleared before that happened. And so with the pool paint, um, some of you might be familiar with the fact that we have a paint shortage. So when we're thinking about a paint shortage, when we're thinking about pool paint, which is you know not as desired a paint as just regular old house paint, it was very challenging to get. And all the red that you see here was mixed using the last two gallons of red pool paint in North America. Yeah, the process was pretty interesting. They were just large, um, uh, large painting roller trays, candles at a set of five, a cart full of smaller paints, and then just big uh, sort of broom-like brushes known as like stainer brushes. And I built some very strange muscles in my forearm. I lost 10 pounds and got a very severe infection in my groin as a result of the heat. <laughs> but uh yeah pretty happy with it how uh how things worked out the uh the the pool looks really nice um the apparently vancouver water is apparently a little bluish so the whole color palette kind of shifted a little bit um now that it, it um yeah had gotten filled i've got a quick thing here just bear with me. Oh yeah, and here was our sketch. Oh, where is it? 
So yeah, we had to do the doodle method on on the pool. So everyone just grabbed a stick and sidewalk chalk, just marked the hell out of it. Drone goes up and then we triangulated it and it just looked like the most confusing diagram I've ever seen. Um, but we managed to actually draw the whole pool in, in about five and a half hours. So here's, here's a pool filled. Um, I'm a little frustrated because these black dots over here, I think are just duck poo. And I went down there frantically today because we had this perfect uh, diffused overcast lighting and uh, there's duck poo everywhere. So I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> The colors, yeah, they get a little tinted blue green, but the blacks get really, really rich, um, which I quite enjoy. It, it has the effect of sort of like an epoxy pour. Over the so I had a question, which is when, why is there a pain shortage? That's a good story on which we will uh, maybe wrap this up, which is that because of climate change and the pandemic. So because there was an ice storm in Texas, Texas is not used to ice storms. Texas produces much oil. A lot of oil is used to make the base for the paint, for the pigment. That is what makes the paint. Oil production stopped for a while because Texans don't know how to deal with the cold. If they had been producing this in like Manitoba, they would have just been like, oh, it's fine. But their stuff froze, production ceased which resulted in, I think it was like a four week delay or something. Anyways, as a result of all of this, the shipping routes got clogged. And as a result of the shipping routes getting clogged between that and the pandemic and the distribution of crude and the production of paint, therein we are in the giant paint shortage that we're in today. I'm pretty sure we've just used up all the paint in Vancouver. I really hope nobody has to paint anything for a while. Uh, so yes, frozen Texans, that's the reason. Well put. I think I've explained this to enough people now that this is like one of my canned responses of, what do you mean there is a pain shortage? Is it because people couldn't work in COVID? I'm like, no, it, it's so much more interesting than that. Um, on that happy note, we're actually at time. We managed to do this for two hours. Thank you for to anyone who stuck around. This is going to also be on YouTube and we will promote it. I'm very happy with how this went. Thank you all so much. Um, too bad Crystal couldn't be here with us today and Chippo to talk about BSRP, but please go and find the all of her programming available online on our YouTube channel. And this will just add to your watching time on getting to know the real world. So for now, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.